You're watching Zoo Tours, the channel that takes you on a virtual field trip to the zoo. On this episode of Zoo Tours, we are making our return for a third wild look at a place that never disappoints, Zoo Tampa at Lowry Park. In case you're new, we've already walked through their colorful aviary, the Asian Gardens, the Florida Wildlife Center, and I'm very excited to give you a look at one of my favorites. Zoo Tampa Safari Africa was officially unveiled in 2004 as the zoo's largest project to date. There's over 16 acres to explore, packed with some of the continent's favorites from the dry forests, savannas, and even gems of the rainforest. Fun, lovable creatures that are always a joy to see no matter how many times we come across them. But there are a select few that we may never see again. Before we begin, I have to thank my main man Johnny for joining me on my visit. So I want you all to give him a follow on his Instagram account and where you can also catch up on your animal knowledge. And also I want you all to tell me what is the rarest zoo animal that you have ever seen? The safari starts right before the main entrance. The Penguin Beach was constructed in 2007 and it was a perfect addition to an already fun attraction. Some might think that wearing a tuxedo is no place for this Florida weather. They probably would be much better off wearing a bikini. But African penguins might as well be right at home. Right now, a retirement in Florida is looking a little better for them than life back in South Africa. African penguins are endangered for a few reasons. People can't keep their oil and plastic in check, and their favorite meals are overfished, causing this penguin to find other options that just aren't nutritious enough. Which goes to show just how important a little sardine can be. And you can learn a little more about them at the Penguin Conservation Center. It looks a little different from Detroit's, but it still does have conservational value. There's a sign about how marine life deals with trash. You can see how you size up against other penguins. And since you're here, you might as well know who you're looking at. You'll also find out that the zoo supports Sandcop, a nonprofit that works to reverse the decline of seafood populations through rescues and releases. And if your zoo has African penguins, they most likely support Sandcob too. We are now under the West Clinton Street Tunnel, painted with animals that you are about to see next with their Swahili names next to them. Clearly a giant spider did some decorating. Man, I gotta stop filming around Halloween. After looking at all that running water, let's say that you needed to go. There are restrooms just beyond the main plaza, but you might be distracted. What once contained meerkats, we were pleased to see that they were replaced with Pierce the African Crested Porcupine, a current or former ambassador animal, which means that she's usually presented to guests on zoo grounds, even without a leash. So not only is it great to have her out full time now, but the world's largest porcupine is always a great addition to any exhibit. And if all this walking has made you hungry, the Savannah Cafe can take care of that. I think it used to have bush babies, but now it's just a really large place to eat. And once you're all fattened up, he'll be about as slow as a reptile that we see often, but I never really talk about. The radiated tortoise is endemic to the spiny forests of Madagascar. They are critically endangered, and I thought it might have to do with those radiating shells. And I'm sure there are people out there that collect them, but their biggest threats are actually habitat loss and being poached as a source for food. The next two reptiles aren't much quicker. What I believe was once a warthog wallow has been taken over by the Galapagos giant tortoises. Now usually when we run into them, they're tiny compared to this guy. If my research through the zoo's Facebook is correct, Winston is estimated between 65 to 85 years old, and a couple of summers ago he weighed 515 pounds. 
The Galapagos Islands are a good 8,000 miles away from Africa, but I'm glad they're here. On the last episode, I showed two of the world's largest tortoises in one exhibit, the Galapagos and the Aldabra giant tortoise. Now I can show you how you can tell them apart, because I'll admit I couldn't at the time. They're not always too far apart in size, and sometimes they're the same shade of gray, so let's roll that out. But the Galapagos' shell is on the flatter side, while the Aldabra has a more dome shape. And if you look at their noggins, the Galapagos' is more round at the nostrils, and if that's not enough, Johnny made a great point that if you look at them from the front, these South American tortoises look like one of Spielberg's greatest creations. Those were some big animals, but now we're getting into the big exhibits. This dry, sandy forest is a mix of southern ground hornbills. We just saw reptiles that can live over a century. This bird can't quite match that. But if you ask me, living to be 60 to even 70 years isn't half bad. Other than a bunch of wild black vultures, they coexist with the lowland Nyala, a beautiful antelope fit with a red-orange coat and vertical stripes that act as camouflage. These are females, while the males are much larger. They have a shaggy gray coat and spiral horns. And if you didn't know better, you'd think that they were a completely different species. And a different species did live next to them, but we'll meet their pretty faces later on. Now the next two mammals can never fall victim to mistaken identities. Really, no matter how much you know or don't know about animals. I'm referring to the mountain zebra, which were not there on my last visit. But they still had the giraffes. <laughs> nice. There's nine different kinds of these savanna skyscrapers, depending on which taxonomist you ask. And you may not be able to tell them apart by their height, but by the colors and the patterns of their spots. We're so used to seeing the reticulated giraffe on the right. And they did have a Rothschild's giraffe at one point. Now I believe it's home to the Maasai or Kilimanjaro giraffe. And you'll notice that they probably won't be the only giant in your viewpoint. Those come a little later. Before we get to them, I want to briefly turn our attention to a species that is probably overlooked. Along the back wall of the cafe is a modest flycage with silvery cheeked hornbills of East Africa. Whether it be in a zoo or the wild, you'll usually see a male and a female, but it's really difficult to tell them apart because unlike most hornbill species, they're practically identical. Rather than being set up as the grand finale, the zoo's largest attraction sets up our grand halfway point, Tampa's Great Big Peanut Loving Pooches. If my internet searching skills are correct, there are six African bush elephants in the Tampa Bay area, five cows and one bull. The oldest was born in 1982 and the youngest in 2013. So, no babies as of late, but three have been born in the zoo's history. One was conceived through artificial insemination, which at the time was and sort of still is seen as a significant achievement, especially when it involves an animal that's vulnerable to extinction. It's widely known that elephants are extremely social within their own herds, but they do coexist with and help out other species on the savanna. Certain birds will eat parasites off of their skin and hair. Baboons will alert them when danger is near. And elephants will trample the tall savanna grass, which allows smaller species to move around, which mainly includes other hoofstock. And in 2020, this herd lived with Kenyan impala in the Nile leechway, an endangered antelope of the swamps and grasslands. An absolute gem to have in a zoo, Unfortunately, on my 2022 visit, the giants were once again solo. Though it's not the prettiest pachyderm in paradise, it still holds up as one of the better elephant setups I've come across. Counting everything, the complex is over three acres, an acre-large exhibit dedicated to the females and younglings, with a 250,000 gallon watering hole that will turn brownish at some point in the day no matter what the weather's like. And as you probably saw, there's another habitat in the back, 
which once again, we will get to later. Because next to these wonderful smells is the gateway to the Rhino Reserve. Sorry, the R No Reserve. After a brief walk down a ramp, you'll come foot to hoof with, well, it used to also have gravy zebras with the southern white rhinoceros. I regret not filming a lot of them because their family is growing large and fast. The zoo welcomed a calf last summer, their eighth in what I assume in the last 20 or so years. Even though they're not endangered, we talked about why it's still important to breed them in that episode in the card above. If you know the zoo well, then you know that this empty space was once a camel ride station, right next to one of the greatest walkthrough aviaries out there. Sadly, neither exist, but what they call the Atori Forest section still has a few surprises. What I want to say originally held cheetahs is now the territory for African painted dogs. I did say that I needed to stop filming around Halloween, but then I wouldn't have seen the great pumpkin massacre of 2020. These pumpkins never stood a chance, of course at living and winning any carving contest. But if you're on the painted dogs menu, you don't have much of a chance either. Hunting in specialized packs, they have one of the most successful kill rates of any carnivore. If the prey is small, they'll simply just be pulled and torn apart. Larger prey requires a different strategy. Painted dogs can top the speedometer at 44 miles per hour, but they prefer faster food. They choose stamina over strength and will chase an antelope anywhere between 10 minutes to even an hour until their meal succumbs to exhaustion. We've talked about why these dogs are endangered and Zoo Tampa also, in a way, kind of shows why. This display case is filled with snare wire used to poach painted dogs. They were confiscated by the Painted Dog Conservation Project and turned into art. And purchasing one of these sculptures keeps them out of criminals' hands and also provides these anti-poachers with an income. Finally, the reason why you're all here and the reason why you'll subscribe if you haven't already. A bird that's about as prehistoric looking as they come. The Shoebill Stork. To many, they're a bird of legend. They're large, up to 5 feet tall with an 8 foot wingspan. They have a very particular look. And they're not even a stork. Shoebills are the only living species of their family. Their genus and species name essentially translates to whale-headed king. However, they still are a part of the order that consists of pelicans, ibises, and herons. And one of their closest relatives is the hammercock. Several sources will say that the shoebill is very, very dangerous. After all, they can kill you with just a stare. They're actually pretty docile. Believe it or not, Zero and Ladybill are on the hunt. Their keeper told us that they're easily distracted and won't eat unless everything around them is quiet. So when we finally did shut our beaks, we saw something that I never thought we'd ever see. The shoebill is fairly scarce in zoos, but Zoo Tampa is working to fix that. In fact, they were the first institution in North America to hatch a shoebill back in 2009. This bird can only be found at one other facility in America. So if you do happen to come across one, take your time to admire them. Because there's a chance that you'll never see the shoebill ever again. Speaking of animals that are on the medium rare side, if you told someone this was a hippo exhibit, they'd probably tell you that it's a bit too small. But it's all right for a pygmy hippopotamus. And no, you're not looking at a baby hippo. They may only weigh a few hundred pounds more than a baby hippo, but this beautiful specimen is fully grown. A float of common hippos can be between 20 to 100 individuals. Pygmies though, you won't find them in bulk. Which is one of the reasons why I much prefer to see them over their giant cousins. The Fiona Fritz thing is getting pretty old. And zoos have a much better reason to breed pygmies, because like a lot of natives to the African rainforests, they are endangered. 
as if it wasn't a pleasure to be in Tampa while Tom Brady implodes, it's always a pleasure to get close to our next stop. The last time we had the privilege of featuring the Okapi, we discussed their relatively recent discovery, but we did leave out why it's probably best that they were never discovered in the first place. Okapis live a pretty secluded life in the dense forests, yet suffer from, well, what you might expect a sought-out creature to suffer from. There's war and other civil unrest, habitat fragmentation, poaching, and the list just goes on. Like I said, they're pretty secluded. But Zach, cool name by the way, isn't alone. Johnny and I were very lucky to see the nocturnal Bay Diker. Just about every other lucky guest thought Cassie here, and I apologize if that's not actually her name, was the offspring of Zack. They may share similar feet, but that really couldn't be further from the truth. The Okapi is part of the Giraffidae family. The Diker is a small antelope. There's 17 kinds, or even more depending again on who you ask, and they're all found in African forests. The Bay Diker might come across paths with an Okapi, but the remarkable alertness has kept them from gaining the endangered status. As small as the Bay Diker comes, they have a big role in the ecosystem. Grass really isn't their thing, but they do prefer oil palm cocktails, in other words, fruit. They'll consume the pulp, but if the seed is too big, like a true baseball player, they'll spit it out and disperse the plant around the forest. Alright, we've got one more, just one more species in the Atori Forest. And that is the vibrant Red River Hawk. But they weren't really in a mood to entertain, so we'll continue on through New Orleans and make our way back to the entrance plaza. If you're sad that it's all over, Safari Africa has even more hidden surprises at the end. I say hidden because the sun glare does a number on this flight cage. So you really have to look for the violaceous Taraco, Javan Pond Heron, the masked lapwing of Oceania, the Von der Decken's hornbill, and the trumpeter hornbill. But the real zoo enthusiast would look for the blue diker. They're like the bay diker, but grayish, and max out at 20 pounds and just two and a half feet long. They are this they are the smallest of the dikers so they're very difficult to find and also not exactly abundant in zoos, which makes the Safari Africa and Zoo Tampa worth visiting even more. Probably the most natural looking setup in the whole zoo is also the most overlooked. Behind all this greenery is the wattled crane, but they're best viewed from the queue of the Expedition Wild Africa Safari. A free half mile truck ride that doesn't just go around the Safari Africa, but shows you behind the scenes and animals that can't be seen on the main path. The two and a half minute pre-show prepares you for your first assignment and explains that you and your party were hired for a special internship to join Professor Ron on his exploration through the Habari Preserve. Once you're all prepped, you'll climb aboard a real safari truck. Now in my opinion, it's best to sit on the left side, but because we didn't have time to ride again, this tour will just kind of give an idea of what the safari is like. Luckily, the passenger side did have a good view of their golden patas monkeys, a primate that much prefers life on the ground, even if a predator is nearby. I'd like to go into more detail, but since the truck didn't stop, the patas monkey will get their spotlight at another time. And that brings us into our first drive through paddock. One of the largest and probably the lushest habitat in the entire zoo. The main attraction is the bongo, but they were putting their secret lifestyles to the test and it paid off because no one could spot them. But we did see a yellow backed diker and experienced a stork block from the marabou storks. They might not be as pretty as the shoe bill, but it's not really their fault that they don't have access to Rogaine. In fact, their bald heads are actually pretty useful because like vultures, this keeps their noggins somewhat clean when they're munching headfirst into a carcass. 
Within the paddock is your second chance to see their third shoe bill. At this time, the tour guides take us out of this large forest and brings us to our first official stop, where you were supposed to meet Professor Ron. When you radio him in, he has this to say. Hi there! It's good to hear from you. I was trying to wait for you guys, but I just saw the coolest thing I had in the broth. I had to follow it to see what it was. You guys have got to get up there. It's incredible. And of course, he was referring to the Okapi. Right past the painted dogs is a second stop. And again, Ron had another excuse as to why he didn't show. I'm doing great! I was just checking in on our pack of painted dogs, and I saw the most amazing thing. They started to chase that prey at 40 miles per hour, and I ran to catch up. Oh, my hat must have fallen behind. I thought I might have better luck if I just jumped in my research mobile, so I drove ahead. Hope I don't crash! And crash refers to a group of rhinos, which they took it upon themselves to kindly destroy Professor Ron's safari truck. The rhinos decided to use my research mobile to file their horn. They got a little overzealous, and one of them punctured my tire. All of your tires. I went the rest of the way on foot. I must have left my binoculars behind by accident. Oh no! But I definitely did not need them to see the animal up ahead. It's Huge. Finally, the last habitat on the Safari Africa tour is reserved for the male elephant Doodla. He weighs about 10,000 pounds, but the zoo still considers him a bit petite. He is a proven breeder both at the Montgomery Zoo and has two offspring in Tampa. Though it's been a while, they are still hopeful that he's still not done blessing the world with little trunks. Wow, I can't believe you guys actually made it this far. That finally concludes the longest tour in Zoo Tours history. So now I want you to tell me what you thought of Zoo Tampa's Safari Africa and how it compares to your other favorite African attractions. And while you're at it, you might as well see if you can answer this trivia question. And with that, thank you all for watching Zoo Tours.